I get the feeling that he's not met a happy and content and peaceful demise. They had lots of harsh punishments. We have burning of the body, general mutilation of the body, and certainly beheading. This kind of status of mummification, this standard, isn't given to just anyone. Just because they're 3,000 years old doesn't mean that we can't apply modern forensics and come up with good answers. If the man wasn't dead already, it certainly would have killed him. Incredible force, incredible violence. Mummies, the preserved remains of the dead, are a unique window to the past. Cultures like the ancient Egyptians, convinced they'd need their bodies in the afterlife, went to extraordinary lengths to develop advanced embalming techniques to prevent the natural decay that occurs after death. Thousands of years on, science allows us to decode the secrets of these preserved bodies to reveal astounding details about the world these individuals lived in. The key facts about their lives, and for many, how they met their deaths. Over 2,000 miles from Egypt, in a museum in the north of England, lies a mummified head. No one knows how it came to be separated from its body. And with just a fragment of this individual to work on, the mummy investigation team is looking at a major challenge. We don't know who he was, how old he was when he died. We don't know where the body has gone. We don't know why the head's just, just as it is. We've got so many questions that need to be answered. But we know he's from Egypt then, I take it? Yes, yes, we do, yes. Yeah. But that's pretty much all. <laughs> Fair enough. So, I mean, we can say, looks like an adult male from Egypt. He's obviously yes. being mummified. So, you want us to do what we can to try and give you some answers? Absolutely. It has to be said, we are used to dealing with complete bodies, not just body parts. So, yeah. we will have our work cut out with just the head. But I'm sure we'll be able to pin down some actual answers to sort of really put flesh on his bones and really put him into his sort of ancient context for you. Team leader, Dr. Joanne Fletcher, is a renowned Egyptologist. She's examined mummies all over the world, but this could be her toughest case ever. First things first, I always like to undertake a, a thorough visual examination, mm. have a good sort of face-to-face. -face. The mummification levels are so superb. I mean, the quality of the preservation of the soft tissue. I mean, look at the profile, that nose is exquisite. Yeah. Um, very rarely do you have that. Usually the nose is flattened to the face with the tightness of the linen wrappings. It's very poignant, in fact, because the expression is, is retained. Mm. So it's, it's almost as if he's looking back at us. This man could have died in a thousand different ways, and with no body to work on, all the team's theories will have to be drawn from the head alone. Bit by bit, the mummy investigation team will try to fill in the elusive details of who this man once was, where he lived, and if possible, how he died. Each member of this well-established team brings a unique set of skills. Duncan Lees works with London's Metropolitan Police and MI5. He'll bring his very special forensic skills to bear on this ancient Egyptian. We're very much a team. Different experience and expertise has to be combined. Dr Stephen Buckley is a pioneer in the chemical analysis of mummification. 
he is one of the very few people in the world able to identify some of the vital chemical clues hidden in this head. The embalmers knew their stuff. And Egyptologist Jill Scott's specialist knowledge of ancient human remains will be vital in trying to unravel the real story of how the mummy died. In forensics, we need physical hardcore evidence. The team is about to be briefed at their HQ in the historic city of York. What they want to know is who is this person, how did he die, and is there any evidence of foul play? So the, the photos obviously clearly show just a head, and, and unless there is a, a photos missing, that's all we've got. Is that the case? What you see is what you get. This is it. It's just a head. And we're used to having complete bodies when we've done other mummy studies, but this is it. It's just the mummified head. So we're really going to have to work hard on this one to pull together all the expertise to try and come up with some answers. I'm going to treat this in the same way that we treat modern cases, This, this a modern murder even. Just because this person is of antiquity doesn't mean that the evidence won't be there for how he died. The photographs prompt the team to ask plenty of questions. On these, these awful neck injuries, I mean, something's gone on there that's... Was it an axe? Was it a, some sort of blade? Was it a garrote? How did this head, you know, how was it removed from the body? And is it linked to the wounds that we've got above the right eye socket? Yeah. I mean, was this individual decapitated really? Did he suffer trauma from stabbing or from, um, from battery, blunt objects, that kind of thing? The first thing that I'm going to need to do is to go back to the archives and see what I can dig up on this person. Um, it'll be interesting to find out when they actually came into the country and see if that's going to fit in with what the science is going to tell us about this person's yeah. status and how they've lived. So, what, yeah, exactly. Yeah. If we can pinpoint him yeah. exactly where in Egypt and when exactly well, in yeah. Egypt, because that has a lot of yeah. bear in the chronology, right. doesn't it? That's right, and I think that the modification can help the materials used change through time. Uh, so if we can identify these, getting a chemical fingerprint of these materials, we can get some idea of who this person was and something about status as well. It's only now that we have uh, the technology has come a long way and we're able to look at answering the questions. Two years ago we wouldn't have been in a position to do this, but now we have a really good chance to, to bring technology to bear on a, on a several thousand year old head and answer the questions about how this poor man died my main concern in this case that it is just a head so we have to sort of be cautious that there's only so much that we're ever going to be able to find out most of the evidence which could throw light on this man's life and maybe explain his death is missing along with his body so it's going to be a tough task to try to unravel this ancient mystery Members of the mummy investigation team are combining the latest forensic techniques to try to determine exactly how this ancient Egyptian died. But even with all their technology, they're still hindered by the fact the body from the neck down is missing. Stephen is collecting skin samples from the head for a GCMS test. It's the first time the head has been subjected to chemical analysis since it was discovered. This will enable Stephen to identify individual chemical compounds used to embalm the head. And the compounds can answer questions about how the man was mummified. It can pick up minute traces of, uh, of a number of things, so we need to be uh, very careful about the sampling side um, so that what we don't pick up is, is uh, modern contamination, for example. His sampling also has to be carried out with precision or he risks damaging the priceless mummy. The mummification will uh, provide um, quite a few clues as to, as to who he was. The, uh, the standard is excellent and, and the materials that we find can certainly help us to put him in his, his proper place in, in history. The equipment is so sensitive that it could detect two drops of blood 
in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Continuing to build the mummy's profile, analysis of his hair could add more information to the emerging picture. It can tell us about the quality of the man's diet, a strong indication of his social status. What I'll be doing when I get back to the lab is to um, extract the organic materials, the organic residues uh, from the samples uh, I've got. Get a chemical fingerprint um, and then of those individual components, put back together the materials employed and that can really be very, very valuable in, in telling us about the life that this person uh, was involved with. Meanwhile, forensic archaeologist Duncan Lees is using a three-dimensional laser scanner to build a virtual model of the mummy. The scan will create an exact digital version of the head, essential for the team's work. What we're using is a laser scanner here to create a dimensionally accurate model um, that we can then investigate without touching the head itself. If we're going to start looking at um, you know, any damage, any lesions, any fractures, any compression that we find, and perhaps trying to relink that to, to weapons or objects or anything else that become a, a sensible hypothesis for the, the cause of death, then that's much better done in a, in a virtual environment. The scanner uses the same echo principle as radar, but using laser light. The laser beam scans the surface of the subject, creating 20,000 precisely measured points every second. This incredibly detailed information is sent back to the computer, which generates a precise three-dimensional virtual model. It has phenomenal accuracy. The margin of error is just 20 microns, 20 millionths of a meter less than the width of a human hair. I get the feeling that he's, he's not met a happy and content and peaceful demise. Um, and we need to do him the, the service and, the, and, and, if you like, give him the justice of trying to find out to the best of our abilities um, how he died and, and put that on record. I think he's waited long enough for that. Before the team can work out how the man died, they must first try to give him his life back by establishing who he was and where and when he lived. The head was donated to the Newcastle Museum in the late 19th century. One of the very few clues the museum was able to pass on to the team was the suggestion that the mummified head originated from the Old Kingdom period of ancient Egypt. This is around the third millennium BC, over 4,000 years ago, when Egypt attained its first great peak of civilization. This was the time of the magnificent pyramids at Giza. At this stage in Egyptian history, mummification was relatively new and relied heavily on the use of natron salts, a simple mixture containing carbonate and bicarbonate of soda. When a body was packed in natron salts, moisture was drawn out of the skin in a vital part of the mummification process. With little else done to the body, Old Kingdom mummies are quite easily identifiable, as they tend to be poorly preserved. But in this case, with no body to work on, it's back to some traditional research work for Joanne and Jill. They still need to find a way of working out where he came from and when. I've been rummaging around in the archives and I've managed to come up with a bit of information on this guy. Um, we know that he was donated in uh, 1877 mm. and was actually found in Egypt at the site of Saqqara. Well, that's, that's pretty good news, actually, because that places him geographically in northern Egypt, Memphis. That's fantastic. We've really sort of got an idea of provenance now. The link to the burial site of Saqqara is a significant development, 
as this was the graveyard for the capital city, Memphis. It was where Egypt's rulers and elite were laid to rest. Clearly, there is an astonishingly high level of mummification going on here. It's, it's not your standard stuff. It's really well done. I, know, I, I do think, certainly, there is a very good chance that he would have been about royal duties in his everyday professional life, because this kind of status of mummification, this standard, isn't given to just anyone. This is really the creme de la creme, I think. To have survived thousands of years with so much detail like the eyelids, ears, and hair intact suggests that this man was mummified to a very high standard, far higher than anything achieved in the Old Kingdom. I think looking at the mummification techniques, we're dealing with something certainly at least a thousand years after that. Right. I think the mummification techniques at the moment are pointing towards a date 1200 to 1000 BC. This revised date for the head's origin could be the first break in the case. The quality of mummification suggests the mummy dates from the later part of the New Kingdom, closer to around 1000 BC. The New Kingdom was the time of some of Egypt's most famous rulers, such as Tutankhamun and Ramesses II. Adjusting the head's date of origin by over a thousand years has huge implications. The results of the GCMS test could provide the definitive proof. Gas chromatography mass spectrometry is the gold standard of chemical analysis, crucial to criminal investigations. The machine works on the principle that every chemical turns to a gas at a particular temperature. By gradually heating the microscopic samples taken from the head, the test should reveal the hundreds of component compounds by examining the point at which they turn to gas. This will provide a chemical fingerprint of the substances used to embalm him. What we've got with the uh, material on, on the skin is uh, a plant oil. Castor oil is one of the main ingredients. Uh, conifer resin, uh, but as a pitch, a strongly heated pitch. Why strongly heated? I think um, the rest of the chemistry is giving us clues, and I think in this case it may be to actually uh, darken it, to blacken ah. it, um, because we also see bitumen in here, but it's only a minor component. Uh, but the fact that it's there at all is helpful. The minute chemical components of bitumen, which Stephen has identified, are an important discovery. Black was the traditional colour of Egypt and also represented life. So the blackening of mummies during embalming may have been a way to display national identity. This development could redate the mummy to an even later period than Joanne suspected. Uh, the use of bitumen here excludes the New Kingdom as a possible source. Uh, it only really came into its own 700, 600 BC. This result is a hard fact the team has been hoping for. Modern science has helped date the mummy to the late period, around 700 to 400 BC. It's about 2,000 years later than the museum's records suggested. The team have now established that this man almost certainly lived in the ancient Egyptian city of Memphis in the late period. This was the last great flowering of Egyptian culture, the final centuries of the glorious era of the pharaohs. Egypt was very much trying to sort of establish its cultural identity, you know, with this onslaught of all these, these foreigners into its yeah. country. At a time when the Egyptians were feeling that they had to reassert their own national identity. Yeah. Yeah. And we're doing it in a number of ways, including through the mummification. But Stephen's scientific analysis yields even more results. In the hair sample, which we can compare with the skin, we do actually see a very similar uh, chemical fingerprint, a very similar pattern with the castor oil, the conifer pitch, and, um, and the balsam. 
uh, and the bitumen. But what we also have is beeswax. It obviously wouldn't have been cheap. So these mixtures wouldn't have been available to just anyone then? No, they wouldn't. The GCMS test has built a much clearer profile of our mystery man. It's told us where he lived and when. And amazingly, it has also identified exotic conifer and beeswax traces in his hair. Both these substances were used in the manufacture of wigs, a popular status symbol for members of Egyptian high society. Filippo Salomone has been researching the rituals and methods of ancient Egyptian hair and wig making for almost 10 years. Using techniques thousands of years old, Filippo has carefully reconstructed the kind of hairpiece a high-status Egyptian man, like this mummy, might have worn. Phil, that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. One of the things that I did learn um, very, very quickly when making this wig was um, just how skilled they were, um, probably more so than they are today, because everything was done, obviously, by hand. Yeah. And um, without the modern tools, this intricate hairpiece has taken Filippo four months to create, and he's used one of the very substances discovered by Stephen in the mummy's hair. The ancient Egyptians did attach each piece individually yeah. um, by the use of beeswax, oh, yeah. by um, drawing the piece of hair along. Yeah. Judging by um, the amount of time and effort and energy it's actually gone to create in this wig, I feel as though he, he would have been somebody of wealth. What we have is the wig is a status item because not only by wearing it to appear different to the vast majority of people in society at that time, you're also sending out the, the, sig the sort of signal that I have enough wealth at my disposal mm. to have people make these things for me. Mm -hmm. And that, that does raise the sort of question, I mean, would he have been so well marked out in society mm -hmm. to have him, you know, made himself a target, perhaps? I mean, could he have been a, a victim of a random act of violence or even mugging? Yes, I was going to say. All these ideas come into your head because, you know, you just can't help it when you look at this wig and you imagine him wearing it. The investigation is gathering momentum. A picture is emerging of the man's life, status and even appearance, but the team still has no idea how he died. Jill has returned to the Egyptian archives in Newcastle. She's looking for evidence of the practice of beheading in late period ancient Egypt. These are all images by Baron Dominique Vivant Denon, who was with Napoleon during his conquest of Egypt. And, you know, he's gone around and he's drawn scenes that he's found in tombs and monuments. And we have some fantastic images of a man here holding a knife with a person beheaded. So his head's on the floor and he's bound to a post. Now, that is perfectly feasible for what's happened to our guy if you actually look at the wounds. So that's actually quite interesting. These have been taken from tombs and monuments, so we know that they do exist, and they definitely show people being beheaded whilst alive as some sort of punishment or ritual. We have all of this evidence here that is saying that it definitely went on in ancient times, which is really important. So people were definitely beheaded at the time. But is that how this mummy lost his life? Joanne has decided to consult a radiologist to investigate beheading as a cause of death. Dr Ian McLeod specialises in the analysis of Egyptian mummies. I think if the head had been beheaded, as it were, I would have expected to see a cleaner cut 
you know, where a, a nax or a sword or something would have cut into the flesh. But what we've got here is a sort of more ragged sort of damage. It's, it's almost, not clean at all. It's is it? not clean at all. It, it's almost as if it's snapped off. Which would explain these kind of raggy areas. Absolutely. Is this muscle or? It, it is partly muscle and the, the skin on the outside, absolutely right. And we can just see part of the bone poking through the, the inside of that. So it looks as if it's just snapped off at some time over the history. So basically we can discount uh, beheading as, as the cause of death? I think it's highly unlikely this individual was beheaded. I'm also very, very intrigued by this quite nasty wound over the right eye. And at first you think it must be a post-mortem wound, the soft tissues come away and so forth, but there's definitely damage to the bone. We know that one of the ways the ancient Egyptians, certainly the pharaohs, liked to execute enemies was to sort of use brute force and bring down a stone mace into their skull. And it often occurs around this area, around the brow area. Well, it's difficult to say just looking at it because, I mean, some of this could have been latter damage. I think what we really need to do to get more information is to get some x-rays. So you think that's the next I step? I think that should be our next step. This mummy did not suffer beheading. That line of inquiry is closed. But Dr. McLeod's analysis has opened up another. The focus is now on the hole in the mummy's head. Could this be evidence of a fatal head wound? Harrogate Museum has a huge collection of Egyptian artifacts. Joanne and Duncan are searching the building's storeroom for a potential murder weapon. So basically, what we're looking for is something like a mace head. What exactly are mace heads? Are these a tool a, a, or a, a weapon? Or? These are, are really pretty brutal things when you look at them. And although a lot of Egyptologists see them and assume they're probably ceremonial or ritual because they are relatively small, I think that they could be used as some sort of really serious weapon here because certainly in the art, what you find um, are scenes of the pharaoh smiting the enemy. They've got the bound prisoner on his knees in front of, of the pharaoh who's raising his hand with one of these in it and he's about to sort of bring down the, the fatal death blow um, using one of these. They are, I mean, they are very well um, made, aren't they? Beautifully finished. Yeah. I'm, I'm quite surprised at the, the different shapes and sizes oh, of them. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. These are wonderful ones as well. These are, if anything, even more brutal than the globular ones. You've got such a sharp edge on they, that. They'd cause a wound almost like a knife, wouldn't they? I mean, yeah. it's a very fine cutting edge almost. It's been finished beautifully. I'd love you to sort of scan one of these because they are absolutely amazing. Well, the works of art, really. But to think that they could have sort of killed someone it's something I'd love to find out. Well, and the good thing is that if we measure them, if we scan them and then start looking at the, the comparisons with the wound itself in the skull and start to identify maybe what sort of shape and what sort of dimension we're looking for, we need to get some of those upstairs and then start if recording we could, them. If we could sort of scan them all, that would be fantastic. Like the actual mummy, the ceremonial mace heads are thousands of years old and just as priceless. What we can do here is scan from above it, but also from underneath it, without uh, having to move the object at all. People have raised doubts. They have said these look too small to have done any damage. They must have been ceremonial. And, and we just want to answer that question one way or yeah, the other. We've been to a number of scenes of crimes where, where objects, you know, not much heavier than this and certainly not much bigger than this, have done awful injury to people. The scan will give the team an accurate digital image of the mace heads. Duncan will then be able to compare the data with the digital dimensions of the hole in the head that he took at the start of the investigation. It's just because they're 3,000 years old doesn't mean that we can't apply modern forensics and come up with good answers. We're adapting techniques that have only been um, adopted in the last two or three years to, to get answers for things that happened thousands of years ago. 
Despite having the latest in modern technology at their disposal, the mummy investigation team is so far no closer to unlocking the mystery of how the mummy died. Duncan is trying to digitally recreate how this man might have been killed, and Joanne is planning to physically reproduce the same kind of brutal injury. She wants to see exactly the kind of damage a real mace can do to a real skull. She's commissioned stonemasons to reconstruct a pair of ancient Egyptian mace heads. They're working the granite with diamond-tipped blades to ensure an accurate finish. And Joanne is on hand to ensure the modern techniques match the high standards of Egyptian craftsmanship. Do you think this looks right? I think it does. I think it's coming on really nicely. You like to take the shampoo a bit further down? Yeah, just just like a, a millimetre, a couple of millimetres maximum, just to get that just... nice curve coming along. Ancient Egyptians wouldn't have had the luxury of power tools to fashion their maces. They would have had to rely on flint to shape the granite and then the coarse texture of sand to smooth it. And the entire process would have taken weeks, not hours. So there we are. Just needs a final rub. It's a little bit bumpy. I mean, you can see already there I rubbed it a little bit with a diamond pattern. You can feel how smooth it gets. Oh, yeah, and that's pretty yeah. quick, isn't mm. it? This, does it feel like...? It feels it feels very, very tactile. It feels just like the ancient ones, because, it, in effect, that's just what you've, you've created. Just put a handle in and you'll whack somebody. Absolutely. And Back at the incident room, Duncan is ready to examine his virtual reconstruction of a mace attack. What I've been putting together is the, is the raw laser scanning data of the mace heads. Um, and so we have the, the data from the mummy's head. And now with this, we have a digital resource that is the mace heads as well. And I've been looking to see whether any of them um, are potential um, cause of death, whether, whether the, the, the mace has been used to inflict the injury above the eye. I've ran through a number of hypotheses and then I've, I've animated the one that seems to suit best and that is an attack from the front or from the side rather than from around the back. When we digitally put them back on that shaft, they come out to be the sort of dimension that you get right. with a claw hammer. You've got a, a strong wooden shaft and then a weighty and in some cases, you know, quite pointed object that would cause a huge amount of damage. You know, I've seen the damage that, that uh, objects like that can do to people, yeah. and it's, it is definitely a potential cause of death. Um, you would definitely be able to inflict the sort of wounds that we're seeing above the eye. Right, so is there a particular one that you think is going to be more effective or at least more likely to mm. be related to the injury that we're looking at? Certainly the ones that we looked at that were, were broadly in two sort of two categories. There, was, uh, there were the ones with the ridge on like you see here and then there were the ones that were sort of more rounded and blunt. Um, both of equal weight, but I think that we're looking at the blunter one right, okay. for the size of the impact and also the sort of the more diffused um, shape to it. Joanne is going to attempt to match the damage on the mummy's skull to the replica weapon. If the skull damage matches, a mace could have been the murder weapon. Pig's heads have a similar skin and muscle structure to humans. Although the bone is thicker, a mace will do similar damage to either skull. The pig's heads will be struck by the two types of mace. Then they'll be x-rayed to see if the damage to the skulls matches images of the mummified head. Basically, these are the two very distinct types of mace heads the ancient Egyptians used. As you can see, they're very, very different in type. Yeah. So if, if I could give you those... Certainly. And then if I put on the heads themselves exactly where I'd like you to aim for to sort of replicate the kind of damage we saw on the mummy, that would be absolutely tremendous. So Double. take it away. Give it a go. All right. OK. I think the second one's done the most damage, I think. Well, you've got a brilliant aim. So this, this one was inflicted with... With this one. With that one, that's yes. interesting. And then this one that I thought, personally, would inflict the most damage hardly seems to have done anything, no, does it? No, no, no. 
That's intriguing. Contrary to their predictions, the disc mace has been the more lethal implement. With all the work that you've been doing, do you think that a blow from a mace head could have been the cause of death for our, for our individual? I have to say that, yes, it could. I have to say that nothing that I've looked at so far rules it out as a possibility. We need to maybe look at the, make, get some x-rays done, take this to, and you and Joe maybe get some x-rays done, look at the type of wound that, that I can't see, so the damage yeah. that's inside the skull. Both forensic experiments have been a success. It looks as if the mummy could have been killed in a mace attack. The team now needs real proof to support the theory. The X-ray machine examines the damage. The focus is on the trauma beneath the surface of the skull that can't be seen by the naked eye. The X-ray images will give the team a closer look at the cranial damage to both pig's heads and the mummy to see if the wounds are consistent with each other. Professor Don Brothwell, a leading paleopathologist, will examine the X-rays. He's an expert in determining cause of death and was a leading investigator for the war crimes tribunals in the former Yugoslavia. Here we have the results of the x-rays back from the experiments we did on the pig heads with the maces. You can see this one is the uh, globe mace head, the circular one. And the effects on the other side of the disc mace head with the uh, nice fine edge. So very different injuries sustained on, on each of the pig skulls. And then we've got the actual skull which also shows this area of damage. So I'd really like your opinions on the sort of comparisons we can see here in terms of the kind of injuries sustained. Well, I think as far as the pig skulls are concerned, the most damage is in the case of the left one there. There's far more damage I can see in that area, which is the top part of the snout, just where it begins to go into the sort of brain box area. Whereas there's little evidence of any damage on the other one. Professor Brothwell has identified extensive damage on the pig's heads. Bearing that in mind, the damage in the human skull is very modest and it follows the contour of a part of the frontal sinus system, the airspaces inside your frontal bone. Now, had it been a real serious impact injury, I would have expected damage to extend into the other parts of the frontal there. The damage to the mummy's skull just isn't extensive enough compared to the more dramatic trauma visible on the pig's skulls. After all the tests, a mace attack can be ruled out as the cause of death for this mummy. But there's still the mystery of how the injuries did happen. It's not an example of, of beheading. Oh, it's right. not a victim of uh, a mace attack. It, it wasn't sort of bludgeon to death. So we need to try and establish exactly how such, you know, quite serious injuries were inflicted on this individual. To be sure that the team haven't missed anything, Joanne and Jill revisit the facts that they've already established about the mummy. We know that he's male. We know that he's high status, uh, both from the, the quality of the embalming, but certainly the results of the chemical analysis even show the, the nature of the hair styling fixative applied to his hair. So we know that in life he would have been quite a dandy, quite flash, he would have worn the, the, the wigs that they wore in those days, of course. Really marking him out in society, I think, as a high status yeah. individual. When we look at the possibility that this individual came from Saqqara, which is the burial place, of wealthy people. Yeah. It's going to be a prime place for tomb robbers 
to target. This person's going to have been buried in all of their finery, necklaces, jewellery, things like that. So tomb robbers are going to want to come in yeah. and rip out all of this stuff because Absolutely. they've got to be in and out as quickly as possible. What we've got here from the ancient times is somebody saying that we found this noble mummy of this king equipped like a warrior. A large number of sacred eye amulets and ornaments of gold was at his neck. It was a real smash and grab raid, exactly. wasn't it? Go in, head off, jewellery sure. chain. And, and, I mean, time was of the essence, wasn't it? So oh, yeah. they weren't going to well, hang about. I mean, they would have had to have done it as quickly as possible to avoid being caught because, obviously, the punishment being caught was really severe. Yeah. You know, we know of examples of um, impalements, yeah. beatings and all sorts. So, you know, they really did have to be expert at getting into these tombs and getting out very quick, so. Well, that would explain both the the, the beheading, so-called, and, and, and this, this blow, blow to the head. So both of which are post-mortem and both of which are certainly not the cause of death. Yeah. But even though tomb raiding might explain these injuries, the team is still no closer to establishing how the man actually died. Joanne is hoping that leading radiologist Dr Ian McLeod's detailed examination of the X-ray results may offer some much needed answers. What we've got is the top of the, the skull there. We've got the eye, and we're just seeing this sort of outline of the nose there. But what really intrigues me about this picture is what's happened to this gentleman's neck. Because here we've got the vertebrae, the top of the neck, and then this little piece here, which is what we call the odontoid peg, the bit that allows the head to rotate. Normally there should be a vertebrae sitting there, but in fact there isn't. It's sitting here. So it's been pushed right back. If I can just put up a normal uh, picture for you, uh, this is a, an older radiograph, but uh, hopefully we'll sort of show it, is what it should look like. And here we've got the same oh, sort of vertebrae yeah. coming up. You can just see on the inside there, there's this odontoid peg, and there's the vertebrae where it should be, and you can see very clearly on here... It's really gone back, hasn't it's it? It's pushed it right back. Would this have been inflicted in life or shortly after death? And this is an injury that must have occurred before mummification. Once the mummification process had taken place, the skin would have been like leather, and what would have happened if you'd applied this sort of level of force as the thing would have just smashed? What kind of action could have, could have displaced it like this? It must have been somehow the head was lifted up and back, almost lifted off to sort of create that. It's it very, very unusual. So some, some kind of violent manipulation of, of the head off the neck. It's it would, almost as if the head's been, the skull's been lifted off the vertebrae. It certainly has in order to allow that vertebrae to be literally physically dislodged over the top of the, the vertebrae beneath it. That's really disturbing. This man must have met a very violent death. And what's interesting, of course, is now having known that, if we go back to the original photograph that you bring in, it starts to make a little bit more sense. Because I, I noted on this strange looking uh, contortion of the neck, and, you know, with a sort of an eye of faith almost, you could imagine a ligature or something around that kind area of, of the neck. Cord or, or rope or something. Something of that nature, which has obviously been pulled at great force. It's contorted the neck, and presumably, because it's at the right site, created that injury. So, what we're really saying here is it's quite possible that some sort of cord or ligature was applied around the throat mm. to strangle this individual and pull tight to create this really horrific injury. Well, that would certainly fit with what we're seeing here. With um, some force. Incredible force. terrible, terrible injury and what a horrific yeah. way to die. Awful. Absolutely awful. This has been one of the toughest assignments yet for the mummy investigation team. This kind of status of mummification, this standard, isn't given to just anyone. But what we also have is beeswax. Would he have been so well marked out in society mm -hmm. to have him, you know, made himself a target? You could imagine a ligature which has obviously been pulled at great force but with limited evidence and no body to go on. The team has managed to figure out when this man lived, where he came from, his social standing, and they know that he was horrifically strangled to death.
Strangulation was not a common method of state execution in Egypt and would be very unlikely in battle. So the mummy investigation team can conclude the mystery man was almost certainly the victim of a brutal murder. What I found quite emotional and, and, and almost humbling was how quickly he became not an object to be measured and looked at, but became a person that you're trying to unravel. I think the science has really helped to put this, this individual into some sort of context. Even if we'd had the complete body, we wouldn't have had any more results. We couldn't have said more than, you know, who he was, where he was from, what the cause of death was. Is it the kind of random attack, you know, somebody crowding in on this guy to sort of steal the wealth that he must yeah. have displayed yeah. in life? Thank <laughs> you.